It's been over a year since my first complete beginner's guide to Stellaris was made, and since then the game has drastically changed with entirely new systems and mechanics, making that old video extremely out of date. So here we go again, with 100 or so more hours in game to give you the definitive beginner's guide to Stellaris, at least until they update the game and change everything once again. A couple of things to note before we get started, this guide is being made with all DLC enabled since that ends up being the definitive way to play. So if I mention something that's missing in your game, just ignore it, as chances are it's DLC. And as you can see by the length of this video, I'm aiming to cover literally every single thing you need to know from the extensive user interface to full scale empire management. As always, everything is separated into chapters, so feel free to jump around if you want something in particular. So without further ado, let's begin with how to choose your empire and set up your game. Some things haven't changed since that old video. My recommendations for choosing your first empire and game settings are some of those things. I'm going to recommend you go with an empire with the potential to adopt any number of playstyles without being locked into one thing. As much fun as it can be to go Fnatic Purifier and take on the galaxy, when you're first getting started, going with something a little more neutral will benefit you in a number of ways. Firstly, you're going to be able to engage in a lot more aspects of the game, so you'll be able to learn more about mechanics and features that you might otherwise miss out on. Secondly, you're going to have an easier game overall since making friends or at least remaining peaceful is a whole lot easier to manage than being at war on all fronts. And thirdly, you got to leave some spice for later on. You don't start at the Carolina Reaper, you go for the Bell Pepper and work your way up from there. Unless you're white, in which case that's probably about as spicy as you get, speaking from experience here. If you own some DLC, you're going to have a veritable laundry list of preset empires to choose from, but to start off with, I'll always recommend the United Nations of Earth. Boring? Yes. But, middle of the road, leaving the door open to play more or less however you want while you learn? Also yes. Later on, once you know a bit more about what you're doing, you can create your own custom empire, and while there are a lot of options and sliders, they're all pretty self-explanatory if you do some hovering and reading tooltips. My creating a custom empire guide will be linked in the description below the like button, but if you want the spark notes, I'll go over the basics. Some things, such as portraits and cities, are purely cosmetic and have no bearing on gameplay. Then there are a bunch of things that do affect gameplay in a wide variety of ways. Traits affect your pops, making them better and worse in a number of ways, be it job performance, lifespan or ease of expansion. This is only pops of your starting species, so if you get any others in your borders, they're going to come with their own list of traits, preferences and specialities. Your empire's origin can drastically change how your campaign starts and plays, with a range of different starting conditions and scenarios, as well as some ongoing quest lines that can continue well into the late game. This is where you find the story in Solaris, so if you're looking for a more narrative-led experience, spend some time here to pick out the right origin for your story. Your government and ethics dictates the broad way your empire operates, such as their approach to other species, how their leaders are decided, and their approach to warfare. Civics are a little bit more specific, kind of like traits for your entire empire, rather than species. And finally, your ruler traits is your starting ruler and initial traits, which will just change what effects they bring to your faction. Bear in mind that most organic leaders do eventually die either of old age or in combat, so if you get a leader you don't entirely love, chances are you'll be able to replace them at some point. Once you've chosen or created your empire, you have the game settings to take a look at. When starting out, you can leave most things on default, but make some minor tweaks here and there. You can make the galaxy size smaller to begin with, so you have less empire size to worry about, as well as less potential threats out there. The larger your empire, the more complicated it is to keep under control later into the game, so a smaller map limits your maximum size to keep things easier to manage. You could turn off the various AI empires if you wanted to focus solely on managing your own empire, but I would advise avoiding this for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it gets pretty damn boring with no other empires to talk to in the cold vacuum of space. Secondly, and most importantly, you're going to end up learning how to play the game wrong, since almost every game will have other AIs or even players if you decide to hop onto multiplayer. Dealing with other empires and threats in all manner of ways is an essential skill to have, so denying yourself learning about it right out the gate is going to put you back significantly. Yes, it's going to seem scary, and they may even destroy you in your first few games, but it's all part of the learning experience. The default difficulty is Cadet, which is one below Ensign, or normal difficulty. You can drop it down to Civilian for your first few games before slowly working your way up to Ensign and deciding if you want to go any higher from there. It's a single player game people, don't let others tell you what difficulty you need to be playing at. Finally, if you want to unlock achievements to show off on your Steam profile, you can turn on Iron Man mode, but I would advise against this while learning, as it'll be a lot less painful reloading an old save and losing a couple of years of progress than it will losing your entire game to avoidable mistakes. Speaking of which, in the actual game's settings, be sure to turn on auto saves to something forgiving, such as quarterly or semi-annually, so you have regular intervals to fall back on should something go drastically wrong. Aside from that, everything else can be left on default and we can load into the game to dive into the admittedly overwhelming user interface. When you first load in, you're going to feel like you're getting barraged by far too much information and too many buttons, but honestly, to play the game at a passable level, you only need to focus on like two or three areas. 
First, you have the most eye-catching pop-ups in the alerts queue, which will appear along the top of your screen, letting you know basically everything going on in your empire. Most alerts will be that regular greeny-gray color, and these can be things such as discovered anomalies, surveyed systems, and completed research. Others will be this orange color, and these are alerts that require your attention to be cleared away. This can be something such as you need to choose some research, or have filled your resources capacity. Generally, clicking on these will take you to the menu where you can fix these issues, so clicking on them whenever they pop up will keep your empire running decently well. A few events can be red, and these are normally very urgent alerts such as ongoing combat or a massive resource deficit. These want to be resolved as quickly as possible, and the same as orange, clicking on them will take you to wherever you can deal with whatever the problem is. When getting started, familiarise yourself with what each alert icon means as it will give you a good idea of what's going on in your empire at any one time. The next, and I would say joint second most important bit of UI, is the resource interface along the top left of the screen. This is split into two sections, resources and capacities, and empire information. First up, resources. From here you can see every single resource in the game, your empire stores of it, as well as the monthly change, with the exception of research which is just an increase per month, with no capacity since it is instantly consumed by research projects. It goes without saying, but ideally you want all of your resources to be increasing per month with plenty in reserves of each. Each resource serves a number of purposes and is produced and consumed in a variety of ways. Hovering over each one will tell you what's used for now they can be produced, so have a quick read to get a vague idea of each, but I'll also break it down. Energy credits are the primary currency of the game. They're produced from mining stations, planetary buildings, and districts. They're consumed mainly as upkeep for most things like ships, stations, buildings, and more. Minerals are a raw material with two primary uses. They're consumed when building resource harvesting stations around claimed systems, as well as buildings or districts on planets. They're also consumed by industrial districts and various buildings to produce alloys and consumer goods, which we'll come to shortly. They are produced from mining stations and planetary districts. Food is of course consumed by all organic pops and is needed for them to survive and grow. It's pretty much only used to upkeep pops unless you unlock specific technologies to use it in other ways. It's produced from agriculture districts and certain buildings. Consumer goods are an advanced resource produced on planets by processing materials. They are then spent on upkeep for pops and certain jobs. Alloys are similar and produced in the same way, but are instead consumed when building a wide range of space-based items such as ships, star bases and megastructures. And if you're wondering what megastructures are, again I have an entire video explaining each one which I'll link below. The short answer is, the large structures which can be built in late game to provide you with a number of powerful bonuses depending on the structure. They're time consuming and expensive so normally only end up with a couple in your games, so choose whichever fits best with your playstyle. Influence is a strange currency since it's not outright produced by anything and is instead accumulated over time naturally. The monthly change baseline stays mostly the same over the course of the game but can be increased through certain diplomatic actions and power projection, both of which I'll cover later. Unity is spent on a variety of different things, such as traditions, leader recruitment and edicts, all of which will be explained as we go. It's produced by jobs and very specific buildings. Research, as I said earlier, is consumed as soon as it's accumulated on research projects. It has three different kinds and all three are produced from research stations around own systems and buildings on planets. Lastly, this diagonal square with a line through it actually houses all rare resources and almost all of them are produced in the same ways, either mining stations or on planets, but they will appear far more rarely than other resources. They're consumed in a variety of ways, such as certain advanced buildings and ships. By clicking on any of these resources with the exception of research, you can open the galactic market to buy and sell resources with the exception of energy credits which work as the base currency. You can do this either in bulk or via monthly trades, both of which have upsides and downsides. Bulk allows you to wait until the market has the best price for you since it's constantly changing as empires buy and sell. Monthly can ensure you never run a deficit or max out your capacity every month, but you can be getting a bad deal if you don't set a maximum or minimum price if you're buying or selling respectively. I would advise trying to maintain a balance without using the market whenever possible and use it temporarily to tide you over through a rough patch, rather than rely on it constantly as a price change could sink you if you're far too reliant. Now we have capacities and empire information, and while that sounds really complicated, it's honestly not that bad. That being said, the first thing is the most complicated and that's empire size. This adds up everything you have in your empire like systems, planets, districts and pops and gives you a final number that is your empire size. Anything below 100 won't incur any penalties but as soon as you get over 100, you're going to start to see some strain. The cost of research, traditions and edicts of all kinds will increase. Granted by very small percentage based changes per point over 100 but still, it adds up over time. Now, all of that being said, don't really worry about this too much. Starting out, I thought it meant you're not supposed to grow too large and stay as a smaller empire, but all it really means is you need to scale your resource production with your empire size to maintain your momentum. So long as you do that, you can grow your empire as large as you want. 
Next to this, we have the number of pops in your empire total. If you have multiple species, this will be split up to show you the breakdown, which is pretty cool, but you don't really need to worry about it too much. Leader capacity is a more recent addition. It's obviously consumed by recruiting leaders to your empire, which we'll come to later. It can be increased via traditions and technology, and you can go over your capacity, but it will severely penalize you with increased upkeep and decreased experience gain. So avoid this if at all possible, especially early on. Starbase capacity is obviously how many star bases you can build and outpost claiming systems don't count. So feel free to build as many of those as you want. This can be increased with technology and traditions as well as for every 10 systems you own. Exceeding your capacity will increase the upkeep of all star bases severely. So again, avoid this, especially early on. And finally, we have naval capacity. This decides how many ships your empire can support in total. This can be increased by technology, traditions, starbase anchorages, and some planetary jobs. Exceeding the capacity will increase the upkeep of all ships, so avoid this when you can't afford it. This menu also shows us power projection, and this is a real simple equation. Double your current naval size and divide that by your empire size. Whatever your answer is, times it by two, and that's how much extra influence you get from power projection with a maximum of two for most empires. And boom, that's all the resources. The final super important bit of the UI is over on the right, and that is the outliner. From here, you can see basically everything important in your empire and interact with it all. You have planets, star bases with shipyards separated for easy building, military fleets, civilian ships, and later into the game once you have them, mega structures and armies. Most of the time, this is just used as a quick tool to see what everything is up to, check if any ships need orders, or find out where they've got to. Sometimes icons can appear next to certain things such as planets and star bases. If you hover over these icons, they'll tell you what they mean and you can simply click on the object to open up its menu and resolve any issues. Similar to the alerts along the top of the screen, orange means requires attention and red means an urgent situation that needs resolving. If you simply just clear all the alerts on your screen whenever possible, you should be onto a decently good start to the game. Now, aside from these essential bits of UI to be constantly monitored, there's of course a few other things on screen that could use some explaining. Simple stuff first. In the top right, you have time controls where you can pause the game as well as adjust speed, which can also be done with spacebar and the plus and minus keys. In the bottom right, you have a bunch of options of customizing your view. You can turn sector view on and off, which will display the different sectors in your empire, which basically means groups of planets, so I'd leave this on. You can toggle high planes, which I would always leave on as the map is far too confusing without it. You can turn on the trade routes map, which shows any trade routes on the map, which you don't really need to worry about unless you're trade focused, so you can ignore it most of the time. Union's map mode will colour empires in the same federation or subjugation the same colour, so you can more easily tell who's on what side. I'd only use this one sparingly, such as when you're at war or doing some diplomacy, so you can tell who's working together. And then you have the different map modes. Default is empire, which simply colours the map to differentiate other empires on it. Diplomatic shows any diplomatic relationship, positive or negative, between you and other empires. And for all of these, you can get more detail by hovering over other empires' territory. Intel shows you how much intel you have of other empires, which we'll come back to later. Opinion shows you how much other empires like you, which helps gauge how willing they will be to engage in diplomacy. Attitude is kind of similar, but instead shows the other empires' attitude towards your faction, which means how exactly they'll act towards you regardless of their opinion, since it doesn't always line up exactly the same. Finally, you have neighbor map mode, and all it really tells you is if the empire is your neighbor, and all that really means is if you share borders. It's a little bit redundant since it's kind of evident, but it can be useful when managing policies. Finally, we have all of the menus along the left hand side of the screen, and this is the area that has changed the most over the last year. At the top, we have your empire's flag, and clicking on this will take you to your empire menu. From here, you can see everything about your empire and its current ruler, such as ethics, civics, and traits. You can view any modifiers affecting your empire, such as effects from completed special projects. You can see all the different kinds of diplomatic packs and statuses, and other empires in each category. Towards the bottom, you can see your diplomatic weight, which I'll come back to later. Lastly, on this screen, you can reform your government, and this allows you to change your civics and government type at the cost of a large amount of unity. This can only be done every 20 years, so carefully consider any changes before confirming. Along the bottom, we can click over to a couple of other tabs. Demographics shows the breakdown of different species in your empire, with the primary species and their traits taking center stage. Below this, you can see anything special currently affecting your pops, and hovering over will show the origin of the effect. Finally, the advisor tab allows you to change which advisor you have speaking to you as you play, which has no effect on gameplay other than sound alerts, so is more for theming than anything else. Now onto the side menus. First up, we have the situation log. On the first tab, you can see any and all situations in your empire, and these can be a large number of things. You have discovered excavation sites, first contact with other aliens, time special projects, and all sorts more which you can discover while exploring. Clicking on any situation will give you a little bit more detail and tell you what you need to do to progress it, whether that's complete research, divert your researchers to a special project, or take a specific kind of ship to a specific location. You can zoom your camera to the related location or mark the area on your map using the top two buttons. If you really want to clear everything here, you can mark all situations using this button to the left of the X, 
but this will make your game a little bit cluttered and confusing, so I'd stick to marking specific choices instead. Not everything here needs completing to have a successful game. In fact, you can completely ignore it entirely if you really wanted to, but if you need some direction or just something to do, look in here for some quick wins and chances are it'll get you some progress and rewards. This is also where you'll find most of the story content in game as different events crop up, giving you long quest lines complete over the course of the game. There are literally hundreds of events, but most of the time, it's like I said, allocating research, sending ships to certain locations and collecting different resources. So just keep checking on any interesting quests to maintain progression. On the Anomalies tab, you can see all discovered anomalies. Anomalies are discovered as your assigned ships explore and survey the map and can be researched for all kinds of rewards, like extra resources in that system, research boosts, and sometimes story events and quest lines. By clicking on one, you can select a scientist in a assigned ship and order them to research it. You can also see the difficulty for that scientist and the predicted time it will take them in days once they arrive on the scene. Just bear in mind, these scientists will drop whatever they're currently doing to start this job, so make sure you're not pulling them from anywhere important. You also can't queue up scientists to do a bunch of these in a row from this menu, as they'll just reset every time you give them a new order. But there's a much better way to do that to clear anomalies out, which we'll come to later. Finally, on the victory screen, you can see every empire you have knowledge of and their score in a leaderboard. Score is worked out by combining how well you're doing in pretty much every aspect of the game. Economic strength is based on all your resource production added up based on their current market price. Technology strength is 1% of the total tech cost of all research technologies, plus a baseline of 60, so basically how much research you've spent. Number of systems, colonies and pops is pretty straightforward. 10 per system, 50 per colony, 2 per pop. If you have any subjects, you gain 50% of their score. 10% of any empire score you're in a federation with is added to yours, but the same is done to theirs. If you've destroyed any crisis ships, which I'll explain later, you gain 10 per kill. And finally, if you've collected any relics, which are items found through quest lines, excavations, and more. Each relic is different and grants a different amount of score, so if you have any, check to see what they're getting you, and of course, I'll explain relics in their own menu. Next up, we have the Government tab, and this is one that's seen the most major changes pretty recently. The main screen is the Council. Here you can appoint various types of leaders in various positions to grant your empire all kinds of bonuses. The reason I'm being so vague is that aside from some consistent positions like Head of Research, these change pretty much every single empire as different civics and governments change what positions will be available to you. Gestalt Consciousness empires, such as Machines, don't actually appoint council members and instead have a single leader with different nodes which acts as positions with no actual leaders required. Hovering over the title of each position will show you what bonuses that position will grant you when staffed, and those bonuses are per level, so again the highest level leaders you can on your council is the way to go to get the most value possible. From this screen, you can also manage agendas. These are empire-wide bonuses that have two sets of buffs, one while preparing and another once launched. There are options for pretty much every aspect of the game and more can be unlocked via traditions and ethics. As long as you have something running at all times that's relevant to what you're trying to do both now and once the agenda launches, you don't need to manage this too much. Some good early choices are Chart of the Unknown for better and faster exploration, Evolving Society for more unity, infinite opportunities for better happiness, and Expand the Council to get more leaders on your council in more advanced positions. The rest really depends on your empire and playstyle, so have a read and experiment see what works best for you. The last thing displayed on this screen is Active Edicts, but we're going to come back to this in the Policies and Edicts screen. The next tab is Factions. From here you get a breakdown of the different factions in your empire, and this means the different political parties. Honestly, I have almost 200 hours in this game and I have never really paid that much attention to this screen and I've been just fine. The only real effect it has on your games is if a faction has high approval, pops in that faction will have increased happiness, and the opposite for low approval. If you're struggling to maintain control of planets, check to see if your approval is low with a majority of their population. To improve approval, select a faction and hover over each of their issues. If you do what they tell you, approval will go up with happiness. Having high support and approval also nets you some bonus unity, so make sure it's all high if you're struggling. Finally, policies and edicts, and this is obviously separated into two different menus. Policies dictates your empire's approach to basically everything, from your default border policy to what types of wars you're allowed to be involved in and declare. Honestly, going through each policy would take far too long, and this is already going to be a pretty lengthy video as is, so all I'll say is stop by here and have a read of each option so you can have a vague understanding of what everything means. If you're changing up your playstyle, then change your policies to fit that new style. For example, if you're going to be doing a lot of warring, set your diplomatic stance to supremacist, make sure you have the most aggressive war philosophy you can, and militarise your economy. The small percentage base changes, but they can add up to changing the course of your game if used right, so make sure you're optimised for your current playstyle as much as possible. Just bear in mind that you can only switch policies once every 10 years, so you need to make sure you're ready to commit to the change, or it'll be a long 9 years and 364 days. Edicts are much more straightforward. They're basically just buffs for your faction at the cost of various resources. Any that cost unity first consume the edicts fund before consuming your regular unity stockpile. Be sure to check on this as soon as you start a game and enable Map the Stars. It's pretty much always covered by the fund and will speed up your exploration for free, so nothing not to love. Later on, they're more of a trade-off at the cost of other resources, so make sure to think each option through before enabling them. 
That being said, if you want to turn one on, but it turns out to drain all your resources, you can turn it off instantly without any real penalty. Coming to the third tab, Society Management, and first up we have Traditions. These are small trees that offer bonuses for a specific area of your game. This means you want to pick specific options at specific points during your game and when you're going for a specific playstyle. For example, Discovery is all about exploration and research, making it a great choice for any empire when getting started. Whereas Diplomacy is all about building relationships with other empires and forming federations, so it would only be more useful to more diplomatic empires later into the game. Some good go-to choices for every game are Discovery for better exploration and science, Domination for better planet management and output, Prosperity for even more output, and Supremacy for more military capacity and power. Upon completing a Tradition Tree, you can pick an Ascension perk, and similar to Traditions, these are very specific offering bonuses, only really useful in certain builds and playstyles. That being said, they're also all very self-explanatory. If you're going for Diplomacy, then you're not going to go for the Colossus Project, and instead will take Galactic Contender. Generally, unless you really need specific parts from different trees, I'd advise you to complete trees one at a time to get the ascension perks quicker, as otherwise you're missing out on some potentially powerful bonuses. Some good perks to grab in most games are Interstellar Dominion for cheaper expansion, Technological Ascendancy for quicker research, Galactic Force Projection for increased military size, Mastery of Nature for maximizing planet use, and Defender of the Galaxy for warding off crises. Honestly, you'll struggle to find a bad option here, so just pick whichever will work best for you now and in future based on your playstyle. Next up we have the Relics tab, from here you can view any relics you've found during your game. Relics are powerful items that can be found by doing all sorts of stuff like defeating giant aliens in battle, completing event chains, excavations and much much more. Each option comes with its own set of effects, both passive and active, with the actives costing resources such as Unity to activate. They can have some pretty powerful effects, so check out any you find to see what they do and if they can help you at the moment. You can also find minor artifacts, mainly from excavation sites but also various events and projects. These are much more common and can be spent on a number of actions to give your empire some specific buffs. While not as rare as relics, they're still relatively rare resources, so make sure you're going to get use out of them before spending any. And the final tab on this menu is the Crisis tab, which only opens up if you decide to pick up the Become the Crisis Ascension perk. This is a very specific perk, very, very specific playstyle, so I'll just go over the spark notes. When becoming the Crisis, there are five tiers of galactic threat, and you reach each tier by accumulating menace and completing special projects using research. Menace is earned by completing Menace Objectives, which are displayed on the right hand side of the menu, and it's pretty much just be as aggressive as you can be, invading and destroying empires in a variety of ways. Each new tier reached unlocks you more buffs and bonuses to help you continue progressing, including unique menacing ship types with some pretty juiced stats, and even a unique megastructure which will obliterate the entire galaxy when completed, getting you an instant victory. It's a very bananas goal and a lot of fun, but not something you should be trying out in your first game. Our next tab is Technology, and this one should be a little bit shorter to explain than the others. As mentioned earlier, research in Solaris is split into three areas, physics, society, and engineering. At any time, you can have one project going in each of these categories to progress you through the research tree. Now, unlike other games where the tech tree is just that and you can see future techs, Solaris takes a different and more confusing approach. While there is a more linear tree somewhere on a whiteboard in Paradox HQ, the game uses a randomized card shuffle approach. This means every time you're prompted to start a new project, you're presented with a hand of cards, consisting of some semi-randomly chosen techs available for research. On the invisible tree there are six tiers with each tier requiring text of the same area from the previous tier to be researched before being unlocked. And the areas of research are these icons on the right hand side of techs. For example, one of the areas is Voidcraft and a mid-game tech is Habitats. If this was at tier 2, then say 5 tier 1 Voidcraft techs would need to be researched before it becomes available and has a chance to appear in your next hand. There is an equation that lets you work out the exact probability of a given tech, but looking at it makes my tummy hurt, so I'll stick to my more basic understanding to get you started. Basically, if you're specifically trying to unlock a certain technology, find out what area of research it's in and choose other techs in that area to increase your chances of finding it faster. It's still random, but puts the odds a little bit more in your favour. As for what you actually should be researching, unless you're being specific, just go for whatever is going to benefit you now or in the future. So if you're struggling for energy, pick up something that will help you make more, like global energy management. If you're going to war, then focus on things like ship improvements, naval capacity increases, and new ships. Eventually, you will unlock everything, so it's fine to just be reactive to keep yourself afloat when you're not relying on a specific playstyle. Next up, we have the Leaders tab. From here, you can see every leader in your empire, as well as the current pool of recruits. Leaders come in one of four classes. Admirals, which can lead and enhance fleets. Generals do the same but for ground armies. Governors manage and enhance sectors. And scientists man science ships. And all of these duties are alongside being on the council. So a leader can be head of science and also man a science ship without compromising on the performance of either. All leaders start off with some traits and unlock more as they gain experience, which occurs just through doing whatever their job is that they've been assigned to. 
Upon reaching level 5, you can pick a specialization for your leaders to make them better at a specific job, such as exploring or research. I find it's best to build leaders for those specific jobs, since you can keep building their skills higher and higher, rather than them just being okay at a bunch of different things. That being said, make sure you have some variety, the last thing you need in the late game is a bunch of surveying specialists when the entire map has been discovered. I tried to get 3 scientists, 1 explorer, 1 anomaly slash excavation expert, and 1 council researcher. If you no longer have any use for a leader, you can dismiss them, but remember, you won't be able to get them back so any experience and skills they have will be lost to the void. And just the same if you need a new leader, just scroll down to the recruits, click when you like, and then hire leader. Certain DLC events can cause paragons or legendary leaders to appear and be available for recruitment, but those are pretty random, so don't rely on them for your game. The species menu is next up, from here you can view every single species in your empire and see the number of pops, their traits and a summary of their rights. You can view or modify their rights in more detail from the set rights button. From here you can change all kinds of settings for species to make them anything from a slave to a decadent ruler too good for work and anything in between. Most of the time you can leave these on default, but if you get halfway through a game and want to pivot into some slavery, you do have that option. You can also set your default rights for any new species to join your empire, so if you want everyone to be slaves or full citizens, you can do either. From this menu, you can also use gene modding to make variants of existing species, if you've completed the relevant research. Hitting the create template button will allow you to add and remove traits from that species and through tech and traditions, you can increase the number of trait points so that you eventually have no negatives and a whole lot of positives. You'll then need to apply this template to a planet that has pops of that species, which will cost society research and pause normal research until completed. Once at least one planet has been converted, you'll be able to colonize new planets with this template. Speaking of which, next up, the planet and sectors menu is next. From here you can see all sectors in the game. Sectors start from a sector capital and extend 4 high plane jumps away in all directions with more planets in this range both joining the sector and expanding the range. Each sector can have a governor assigned to it to enhance the planets within in a variety of ways. From this menu you can see a bunch of info about the number of systems, planets and pops in the sector as well as resources being produced inside. The button which says sector settings is a holdover from a previous version of automation but the short version is it doesn't really work so just leave it on nothing. Speaking of automation you can transfer resources to either a shared stockpile which all sectors can make use of or a local one for a specific sector. Resources in these stockpiles will be spent on planets with automation enabled to build and develop them over time which we'll come back to later. You can set up monthly transfers to the shared or bulk transfer to the shared or local depending on what you have and need at the time. Lastly, from this screen, you can create a vassal from a non-capital sector, which will create a new empire from that sector, which is automatically a vassal. I'm not entirely sure why you'd want to do this outside of one less empire size and stuff to manage, but the option is there. The expansion planner is next. From here, you can view every single planet you've surveyed to assess if they are fit for colonization. There's all kinds of info here, but the main things you want to worry about are the habitability, size, and number of rural districts, as well as any modifiers. This will let you know how well your species can make use of the planet, how many districts they'll be able to build of various kinds, and anything special that makes the planet unique or dangerous. Most of the time, I take the colonizable box, sort by habitability, and anything that's green and doesn't have any terrible modifiers, I'm going to go for. Habitability is dictated by the planet type, your species' preferred planet type, and any traits that they have. Next, we have the fleet management menu. First, we have the actual fleet manager. From here, you can view all military fleets you have so far, as well as create new ones from scratch. Whichever you choose, you can add ship designs to fleets, set their desired quantities of each kind, and then hit the reinforce button to automatically assign the jobs to all nearby shipyards to fill the fleets up to your desired specifications. If you find a fleet composition that works really well, you can copy the template to another fleet, exactly the same, and hit reinforce to get it started. You can also manage a number of other settings from inside of this menu about your fleets. Along the top, you can view their three kinds of HP, the current number of ships in the fleet compared to their max capacity, and the fleet's military power. You can assign an admiral leader, decide the fleet's stance and home station to return to when given the order. Bonus tip, I'd always advise setting military fleets onto the aggressive stance. All it means is they'll attempt to end combat with any hostile fleets present in the same system, rather than sometimes sitting there looking lost. Further down, you can also order the fleet to go for repairs or upgrades. If you're not fighting and can afford to, doing both of these whenever possible is advised to keep fleets fighting at peak performance with the best gear they can get their hands on. You can create a mercenary enclave from any fleet larger than 50 when you have capacity. This will make a separate faction in your borders which will take on jobs from any empire and pay you back in dividends. So if you have a fleet burn a hole in your pocket with upkeep but no work for it, consider this as an option. You can always rent the fleet back should you need it, and all services are offered at a reduced price than normal mercenaries. Finally, you can disband the fleet which will delete all ships, so be very careful with this button as it is certainly not free to build more. 
Our next tab is the Ship Designer. From here you can design custom ships for use in your fleets. By default the game automatically designs ships in what it believes to be the best loadouts, but if you're min-maxing and know what you're up against, you can make better builds with all the same parts available to you. I've made an entire video about fleets and ship building, which I'll also link in the description below the like button, and I'll come back to this screen later in the ship and fleet design section to give you some ideas for builds. Next up we have Contacts. From here you can see every other civilization you've made contact with in your game and sort them by type. Empires are proper space age civs which occupy space stations, just like yourself. Fallen empires are a specific kind of empire which do not generally expand until awakened, at which point they'll rapidly expand with their insane military power. Stay well away from these when getting started, as they can quickly tank your game if they turn on you. They're also basically immune to all diplomacy, so the best thing to do is leave them alone and do not get too close. Pre-FTL civilizations are planet bound civs that haven't quite made it to the space age yet and the spore game is their life. You can find them with this symbol on a system and observe them for research as well as all kinds of events and options once they eventually do reach the space age. Other contains all of your enclaves such as traders, artists, researchers and more. It's basically any civilization which only really exists to serve a purpose to other empires, be that mercenary ships, trade deals and all sorts more. Finally, non-player is of course everything which is in your own empire or another player's if you're in multiplayer. Mainly, you want to use this screen to monitor your relationships with the other, quote, player empires. Now, yes, I know it calls them non-player, but all I really mean by this is the other space age empires you can actually interact with in diplomacy. The other empires that are basically the same as you, but not being played by you. From this screen, you can see the relations between your two empires, any specific statuses between you, such as trade deals or wars. If you have intel, you can see how many planets each empire has and their overall strength relative to yourself. You can view any federations empires are a part of, and finally, if they are at war as the aggressor or defender. Clicking on an empire will bring more info about them up on the left hand side of the menu. You'll get some basic info about their empire type and ethics. Intel is how much info you have on that empire and will unlock more info about them the higher the level is. Below that you have all info that you have on that empire currently and this will be based on your amount of intel, so don't be surprised to find most of it missing to start off with. At the top you have their attitude towards your empire as well as the relations between the two. Below that you have their diplomatic stance which can give you an idea how they react to certain situations. Below that you have relative power, same as in the list, and hovering over this will break it down by fleet power, economic and technology level. This is useful for deciding which empires to interact with in what ways, as they may be much more powerful military wise, but dirt poor, opening up an alternate strategy. To the right you have your empire size, number of pops and diplomatic weights. And finally in the scrollable box at the bottom you have all their interaction with other empires from wars to federations just like in the relations section of your own empire. You can also get to the diplomacy or espionage screens from this menu but we'll go over those in their own section. I promise we're almost done with UI, next up we have claims. This is super simple. Open this menu and click on any system that you would like to own that are already owned by another empire. This will cost influence on all the system's owner and give you the option to declare war in order to secure those claims. If you manage to take the system during a war and get them to surrender to your war goal, you'll take the systems for yourself. And finally we have the Galactic Market. We already covered this in the resources section. Trade resources in bulk on the left, set monthly trades on the right simple as. Once the galactic community and galactic market are founded, which I'll come to later, the slave market will open up and allow you to buy and sell pops from any species you have classed as slaves in your species menu. Slaves are a little different to normal pops as they consume reduced amounts of amenities and housing and are generally much cheaper to maintain. However, it's not without downsides. They're harder to keep happy, while it may not matter too much to you, they can still increase crime if it gets too severe. If a planet with slaves reaches low levels of stability, the chances of dangerous events is much higher, so maintaining control is imperative. Slaves also have a lower resource production than normal workers, so while you may be getting cheaper labour, it's not going to be the most effective. It's something worth looking into if you're struggling to fill jobs, just be cautious of taking on too many and having a revolt on your hands. And we are so so close to being done, but there's the bottom left of the screen which changes a lot, but one thing that remains constant is control groups. By default your starting planet, fleet, science and construction ships are on 1, 2, 3 and 4 respectively. But by selecting basically anything and hitting control and a number, you can assign it to that control group. Pressing that number will then select that item, allowing you quicker control. Personally, I hardly ever use this outside of wars, and even then it's rare, so don't worry too much. It's more preference based than something you need to actually be able to use. Now we finally have gone through the extremely extensive UI, we can move on to how to actually play the game and get started with your galactic empire. Again, I have an entire video all about how to start every single game of Stellaris linked below, but we'll go over the basics once more. Most of the time your empire will start in control of a single planet in a single system and have one science ship, one construction ship and a small fleet under your control. Now I say most of the time because some origins change these conditions, but if you're playing my recommended first game of the United Nations of Earth, you'll have these conditions guaranteed. Science ships are responsible for exploration and surveying of new systems, and they want to start this job immediately. You can either do this manually by entering map mode with M and right clicking on systems you want surveyed and send it off. 
By the way, get acquainted with the map view as it's where you're going to be spending more or less your entire game. System view is very pretty and all, but it's basically unnecessary outside of directing fleets and armies. Alternatively, you can use automation to have them do the same job wherever they see fit until they run out of options. You'll notice from this option, you can also order them to automatically investigate anomalies, excavate archaeology sites and research special projects. Later on, when you don't need to explore and expand as fast, using these other options is a great use of their time. Just be aware that anomalies has a little bit of jank as they have just as much chance of researching those in your borders as they do of heading to the literal opposite side of the galaxy. It's good practice to get a couple more science ships on the go as early as you can to speed up that initial exploration and open up the map as fast as you can even if you're not planning on building wide. And if you're wondering what building wide means, it just means expanding as much as possible instead of having a small empire with a more condensed production. While your science ship is exploring, you want to get your construction ship to work exploiting the resources currently in your home system. Again, you can do this manually by selecting build projects in the bottom left and placing them in your system, but it is far easier to enable automatic construction. This will order the ship to build on any resources in your borders. And normally I build myself a second construction ship relatively early and have one always on automatic, whilst the other focuses on expansion. To build any kind of ship, but particularly science and construction, select a starbase with a shipyard from the outliner, go to the shipyard tab and queue them up for construction. As soon as they're done, you can find them on the outliner and get them to work. Signed ships will require you to provide them with a leader, so make sure that they're staffed up with the most suitable leader for the job and get them to work. Speaking of which, if you want to build on another system, wait until it's been surveyed and the name has turned white, select your ship, right click and select build starbase. It costs influence and alloys, so make sure you have enough to get expanding. Your early military fleet won't be able to fight much with only three ships, so good practice is to fill it up using the fleet manager and reinforce every time you have a lot of spare alloys to eventually have yourself a full stack. Normally it costs about 2000 alloys to get 20 ships on the go, so you should just top it up whenever possible to make sure you don't get caught out with no fleet power. It'll still be pretty weak, but you'll be able to take on very early NPCs should you come across them. Just check everything's fleet power to make sure they are in your favour, as losing a fleet early can be devastating without the resources to replace it. You'll also need to make sure you set up some initial research, and good choices are these ones which increase research speed since you want to scale up as fast as possible, so why not start out with that while you have no real need for anything else. Like I said earlier, research is just based on whatever you want slash need at the time and in the near future. So once these are done, you should have a better idea of what exactly that is. I would like to give some good early choices, but since they don't show up every time, it's a little bit difficult. My advice would be anything that helps you grow fast to get started, like colony development speed, surveying speed, and anything that creates minerals and alloys. Once all of your ships are working and your research is chosen, unpause the game and let it play and get to work doing all those 4Xs whenever possible. And that is explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate, though don't worry about that last one for now. The early game is more or less the same every time, so you want to focus on exploring the map, meeting the neighbours, scoping out an early threats, and generally laying the foundations for what sort of game you want to have with research, resources and positioning. If you do come across any neighbours, it'll start first contact, and all you have to do is assign an envoy and monitor the progress as it pops up. Sometimes you'll have choices like abducting one of their population or being otherwise aggressive right off the bat, so just have a quick read and choose carefully to make sure you're picking the right option for your playstyle. You'll likely come across some anomalies when exploring and always leave these for now since you want fast exploration over everything. The anomalies will be there later, so you can always come back to them once you're ready. You'll also want to start at least mentally planning where choke points are going to be in your empire. Even if you have no interest in war, it doesn't mean it can't find itself on your doorstep, so plan where you're going to have defensive star bases in your empire to keep everything safe. Obviously, choke points for a single system are the best, since it'll be the only route for invaders. Here, you'll want to upgrade star bases to star ports, which you can do by selecting the star base in the system view and hitting the upgrade button. This will open up two modules and one building, and for defense, you'll want gun batteries to start off with, but hangar bays are generally your best option once unlocked with research. The buildings, disruption field, or target uplink are great choices. And if you want even more security, head to the defenses tab and build some defense platforms, which are basically ships that live inside the starport and come out to defend it when it's under attack. While we're talking star bases, they can also do a lot more than just defending your empire. There are modules for shipyards to allow them to build more ships, trade hubs to allow for better trade in your empire, which again is a weird system, but basically more money, they can build sensors to gain vision beyond borders and set cloaked ships, produce all kind of resources, increase resource storage, buff new and existing fleets in the system, and a whole lot more. Generally, I prioritise my capacity on defending my empire, but if all choke points are secure, then you can't go wrong building them in the most productive systems, as chances are there's something that you can build to make them even better. Also, be sure to spread shipyards throughout your empire to make sure you can get reinforcements where they are needed as quickly as possible. 
The last thing you want is war on the opposite side of your empire to your shipyard, and reinforcements taking a decade to get there. Anyway, back to the early game. You'll want to focus on fast expansion early, no matter what, to increase your resource production as fast as you can. Systems are well and good, but planets are where it's at for getting real control over production. While each galaxy is unique, your empire will have a certain guaranteed condition for their initial expansion, normally in the form of colonizable planets being nearby. So prioritize surveying these systems and colonize as soon as possible to increase your production as fast as you can. As I mentioned earlier in the expansion planet, you can see how habitable planets are and send colony ships out any you wish to take. Anything green I normally go for unless it has a crippling modifier, so have a quick read before sending over a ship. Speaking of which, we should probably talk about how to manage all these planets in your empire. Every planet is the same, but different at the same time. They're the same in the sense that, theoretically, you can build literally anything you want on any planet since there are very rarely requirements and restrictions on anything outside of size, but they're different since every planet has its own set of features, size, and number of different districts. Before we go into what you should build on each planet and how you know, let's go over how to keep planets stable since it doesn't matter how min-max they are if they're falling into chaos. When you have a planet selected, everything you need to know to keep it stable and happy is in the top right of the menu. This scale icon and number tell you what the planet's stability is. This is affected by pop approval, overcrowding, low amenities, and crime. High stability grants increases to resource production, while low stability does the opposite, along with negative effects up to and including possible revolts. Keep those factions happy I mentioned earlier, and you should be off to a great start. Overcrowding just means more pops than housing, and this can be fixed by building districts and buildings that create housing. Amenities are resources produced on each planet and are consumed by all pops on that planet. Just make sure you're producing more than you're consuming, and you should be just fine. They're made in city districts and certain buildings, such as hollow theatres. Crime is a byproduct of a very large population and low happiness, so keep people happy and build enforcer employing buildings to keep the peace once size gets out of control. One last area on this top right section is the available jobs and unemployed pop numbers. Just make sure you have a few available jobs at all times to keep pops employed. Unemployed pops will produce no resources and potentially increase crime, so keep them working to maintain progress. If you have unemployed pops on a planet but cannot create more jobs, you can also choose to resettle pops, which transports them between your planets at the cost of energy. You do need a certain policy or empire type to do this, so if it's greyed out for you, don't worry. Migration between planets does occur naturally, so unless your empire is bursting at the seams with pops, it generally balances itself out. And honestly, that's really all there is to it. If planets are stable, you can now focus on how to build up each one. Outside of modifiers which can be different on every single planet in every single game, there are two things to consider when deciding how you should specialise a planet. What you need, and what space the planet has. The first one is obvious. If you need food, then it makes sense to specialise a planet to create food, but the second also needs to be considered to make sure that your plan will work. If you need food but a planet has space for one agricultural district, then it's hardly going to get you out of the hole, and it'll be better spent in a different specialisation while you sort the problem elsewhere. Just look at the available districts when deciding how to specialise. City and industrial share capacity but the other three each have their own for the raw resources in game. Early on a common first specialisation outside of your capital is alloy production since you want to rush them to allow you to expand just about everything you do in your empire. To specialise a planet for alloy production you can do three things. Build industrial districts which consume minerals to create alloys and consumer goods, build alloy foundries and other buildings to create alloys from minerals, and change the designation of the planet to a forge world. Designations quite literally specialise that planet for a specific job, and every planet should have one of these chosen by you for a number of reasons. First of all, it's free buffs to whichever production you need, so why not? And secondly, if you ever go the route of automation, which we'll come to shortly, it'll tell the game what it should be working towards when building up the planet. All planets have the same choices with the exception of capitals, which have their own set, which changes depending on your empire type. If you've unlocked enough ascension perks, you'll unlock the option to ascend planets, and all that means is the empire size produced by the planet goes down, and the effects of your chosen designation goes up. It's quite a late game thing to do to burn unity, but it can be useful for making your most productive planets even better. Some other specialisations are a little less obvious, such as research. If no districts contribute to a specialisation, but buildings do, focus on city districts, which not only have increased housing, but also open up new building slots. Just make sure you pick a designation as soon as you colonise a planet so you know what you're building towards every time you can expand. And don't worry about picking the wrong one, designations can be changed at any time and while you can't replace buildings for free, once you get later into the game it's a drop in the bucket of your economy, so it can be very doable if you need to respec. Also be aware that some buildings can be upgraded as your planets grow and you complete research. The planetary administration or the main building should always be upgraded as soon as possible to increase basically everything on your planets like housing, stability and unity producing jobs, and planet defence. Others you'll want to take a closer look at before to make sure that you're not going to burn through your resources. One upgraded upkeep might be manageable, but add up a few and it quickly becomes too much. 
Don't worry if you upgrade too many buildings and dip into the red. While you may not get your money back, you can downgrade buildings to keep the base without getting the extra upkeep or production. You should also have a look at any blockers on planets by clicking the features button. If you have the appropriate tech, you'll be able to remove blockers, opening up more capacity for buildings and districts on your planets to really make the most of them. You can see what your planet is producing and consuming on this screen, and I honestly wouldn't really worry about this unless you're in a severe deficit for your actual economy. Planetary deficit doesn't really affect anything, but if you run out of something in your entire empire, that's when you're in trouble. One last thing about this page is decisions. These are various actions you can take which will affect a variety of things on the planet specifically, such as discouraging growth at the cost of increased pop upkeep, or martial law to increase stability but reduce all production and growth. Most of them are temporary measures to fix problems, so if a planet is really struggling, take a look here to see if any of the options might help. Just remember to turn them off once the issue has been resolved. On the population tab of the planet, you can see all kinds of info about the jobs on planet, sorted by their different tiers of pops. By clicking on a job, you can prioritize filling it over others, but honestly, I have basically never done this. I tend to build as planets need more jobs, rather than mass expand and let it fill up over time. This means jobs fill up based on what was recently built, so it doesn't really need priority, but it's there if you need it. On the right hand side, you can see the species breakdown of the planet, as well as if the population is growing or not. I'm going to come back to armies during the war section. Holdings is only available if you're playing as a mega corporation and allows you to build offices on other empires' planets. In these offices, you can build all kinds of buildings which affect that planet and grant you many kinds of rewards like resources and buffs. Most of the time, it has no purpose, so just ignore it. If you click on a planet you haven't yet colonized, there is one more button we haven't mentioned, and that is terraforming. This is a later game tech and allows you to spend large amounts of energy to convert one planet type to another with the goal of making it more habitable for your population. This takes a lot of time and resources, but is a great way to burn some late game cash to get more planets under your belt, especially if they're already in your borders. Now, if all this planet stuff seems too complicated alongside everything else in game, don't worry about it, it's not a skill issue. Well, it kind of is, but if you knew, it's fair enough, and automation is here to save the day. Now, some people will tell you to avoid automation when you're starting out because you won't learn the game right, and while there is some merit in that, I see it this way. If automating some stuff helps you get started and have fun with the game, that's better than forcing yourself to turn it off, getting bored or frustrated, and never coming back. So, let's get into it, and we'll start with planets since we just talked about the manual route. Assuming you've manually set designations of your planets, which you should, you need to do two or three things depending on the planet to get automation sorted. First of all, you need to make sure your planets are all in sectors. If you have one that's not in a sector, select it and click the Create Sector button and you're ready for step two. Next, you'll want to go into your planets and click the Planet Automation button until it lights up orange. The gear will let you choose what you want automation to do. Honestly, if you're automating, just let it automate automatically, so leave it all enabled, but feel free to have a read to find out what each option means, but they're all really useful if you ask me. The final step is going back to the sectors menu to make sure the shared stockpile has resources in it, either from bulk transfers or monthly. I recommend tossing in a few thousand in bulk and then stick into monthly to keep it topped up without your interaction, but live your own life if you fancy it the other way around. And that's quite literally it. If you see no errors in the event log and you can see buildings getting queued up in the outliner, you've done everything right and your planets are automated. Now be warned, the system isn't perfect and can cause deficits, but generally it's pretty decent, especially early on at growing planets quickly and to your chosen designation. So it is imperative that you set them manually, but auto picker is not the best. So just do it, even if you might end up changing it later. Outside of planets, your other options for automation aren't quite as complicated, but they can ease some of the strain when learning. We've already mentioned science and construction ships, which can automate basically all of their jobs. You can also automate research by clicking the cog icon and the game will just pick the cheapest possible research every time to slowly move through the tree until the end. And lastly, you can automate ship designs, but it's not exactly the most effective in practice, so you're better off tweaking things yourself once you get a little bit more comfortable. And that is honestly the trend with all automation in game. It's fine, but compared to making all the decisions yourself once you know a little bit more about what you're doing, it's not even close to being as effective. But while you're learning, I think it is a great tool to alleviate some mental strain. And even when you get comfortable, I enable automation when I'm in an intense war, as I want all of my focus to be on that, so I let the computer keep things floating whilst I do. Speaking of war, we should probably talk about ship and fleet designs in a little bit more detail. By default, all of your ships will automatically be designed and contain what the game thinks is the best design possible. But that's not going to hit the mark every single time against every single kind of opponent. I mean, how could it? There are three kinds of health everything has. Shields, armor, and hull, and they are taken away in that order. Some weapons are stronger or weaker versus certain health types, such as lasers being weak to shields, but strong versus armor and hull. While others, like torpedoes, just ignore shields and go straight to the hull, but are vulnerable to point defense, shoot them out of the sky, or space in this case. If you know what you're fighting and it's shield and laser focus, then you can build to counter that with lots of shields and kinetic weapons. But most of the time, you don't know what you're up against, so a good meta build is a combination of two fleets. Firstly, you have the large ship spam, with a Titan and two kinds of battleships. The Titan and one battleship type are going to be focused on artillery spamming with tons of kinetic weapons to rip shields apart and destroy the hull within. 
The other battleship type is going to be more defensive, with point defense and strike craft to take out enemy small fighters and projectile weaponry to keep fleets safe, as well as some torpedoes for even more damage. All of this with a balance of shields and armor, and you're ready for anything. The other is more simple, pure corvette spam. A mix of gunboats and some point defense to stay safe from strike craft with crap loads of missiles, tons of speed, and a balance of defenses. Larger ships won't even be able to come close, and smaller ones will get obliterated before they even have a chance to make a move. Put one of each of these fleets together, and you can pull up on just about anything and come out on top. Bear in mind that the meta changes all the time, so this is probably wrong already, but it works decently well at the time of writing. When creating any custom ship, there is a range of components to choose from alongside just weapons and defenses. You have combat computers, sensors, engines, jump drives, and more, but it is all powered by a reactor. Everything you place in a ship has to be within the engine capacity of the reactor to be a valid design. If you have power left over in a design, it'll give these ships some slight buffs to evasion and damage, but it is extremely minor, so I wouldn't focus on this and instead work on using all the power that you do have to make the best ship possible. As I said with the different damage and defense types, it all really depends what you're fighting against, so do your best to scout out enemies and build accordingly, or stick to whatever is meta at the moment. And let me reiterate, no matter what the comments say, when you are learning the game for the first time, the auto ships are fine to get you started, and while they won't be the most effective versus everything, they'll do a passable job to begin with. And if you want a more balanced fleet, you can just take half of what we just talked about, so half corvettes and then mix of larger ships. Just make sure the auto designs have some point defense to take care of missiles and such. As long as your fleet power number is much larger than what you're going to fight, you're probably going to have an okay time. But how do you know who to send all of these ships after? Well, that's where diplomacy comes in. After you complete first contact, other empires will start to show up in the contact screen. Once an empire is selected, you can choose to engage in diplomacy or espionage. And don't worry which one you choose from here, as you can switch between them both in the following menu. First of all, diplomacy. You get the same info as before, but now there's even more details, such as number of planets, any loyalties, and their origin. You can also see their specific relation modifiers with you to the right, so get an idea of why they're feeling how they feel towards you. On the right hand side of the menu, you can see all possible actions you can make in diplomacy, and there are a lot. So let's rapid fire. Improve or harm relations does just that, employing an envoy to make the number go up or down to be friends or enemies over time. Build spy network also employs an envoy to set up a spy network, but we'll come back to that one next in espionage. Declare war takes you to the war menu, where you can choose a war goal and declare war on that empire. War goals range depending on your empire's relations and more, so choose whichever one fits your playstyle the best. Also take note of any alliances either side has, since declaring war on a single empire can bring the entire galaxy down your head if you're not careful. Offer trade deal allows you to build deals for all kinds of stuff, you can trade resources either in bulk or monthly, exchange mapping info and contacts with other empires, and either offer favours which are basically borrowing acceptance chance which can be cashed in later to get a better deal for the favour holder. Obviously this is great for friendly empires to get their hands on all kinds of goodies to benefit them and their allies. You can open or close borders to allow ships to move through each other's territory. Establishing an embassy will increase the power of friendly envoys and provide intel about each other's empire. Non-aggression pacts means neither empire can attack the other without first breaking the pact. Commercial pacts will increase the trade value for both empires. Again, it's a bit of a strange system in Solaris, but the end goal just means more money. Research agreements obviously share research, increasing the speed at which each researcher's text the other empire has already discovered, effectively increasing research speed for all. Migration treaties allow pops from each empire to migrate between each other's planets. This is great for maxing out habitability on planets, since every species will have different preferences, but chances are a mix of pops can make the most of any planet. Defensive packs will cause any war declared on one empire to be declared on both. Form Federation will allow you to create one of the many kinds of federations with the tagged empire. There are currently six different kinds. A Galactic Union is a general federation really acting as an upgraded defensive pact and offering general benefits to combat and diplomacy. A Hegemony focuses on resource production, while the Covenant focuses on unity, ascension and other spiritual features. A Martial Alliance focuses on war and combat. A Research Cooperative of course focuses on science. And a Trade League focuses on increasing trade value, aka money. Each of these has five levels with increasing benefits. You can increase level of your federation by assigning envoys as well as passively maintaining your federation over time. We'll need to make sure your federation is cohesive enough to exist as differing ethics can drive empires apart without proper support from envoys. Every federation also needs a president who receives extra buffs and bonuses and is decided differently depending on your federation laws. Depending on the type, you may be able to request a federation fleets who are controlled by the president and can be used in any wars the members find themselves in. Lastly, you can modify the laws, which affects contributions to fleets, how you rotate presidents, how long a presidential term lasts, whether you allow subjects to join, how votes are counted, war declaration conditions, policy for inviting new members and kicking existing ones out, migration, and whether you can have separate treaties with others. It's all very self-explanatory and more options open up the more you progress your federation to higher levels. Back to diplomacy. Support independence can be offered to vassals, letting them know you will join them in war if they declare it against their overlords. Guarantee independence is more or less the same, but means that if they are attacked, you will lead to their aid no matter what, but they won't do the same for you. 
Propose subjugation, ask that empire to become your subject, and ask to be their subject obviously does the opposite. If you're interacting with a subject empire, you can propose a secret fealty, which begins the transfer of ownership to you, much to the displeasure of their current overlord. You can insult an empire to reduce their opinion of you, to reduce relations. Make claims takes you to the claims menu to claim some of their territory as yours. And finally, declare rivalry will grant you an option when declaring war on the empire, as well as gain you some monthly influence. Onto the espionage tab, and this is quite possibly one of the most confusing and seemingly useless screens in the game unless you build entirely into it. You can assign an envoy to set up a spy network which will begin accumulating infiltration. This is a resource spent only on operations listed below, ranging from increasing intel to creating fleets of hostile privateers in that empire's territory. Infiltration is slowly gained over time and is gained faster or slower depending on that empire's relative encryption. This puts their encryption stats against your code breaking stats and both of these are affected by the subterfuge tradition tree and certain technologies. If the relative encryption is very weak then you'll gain infiltration faster, have an increased capacity and reduce the difficulty of operations. Operations all work in a percentage chance based system where a bar fills up and over time increases the chances of a breakthrough which normally means success or some event which gets you closer to it. The higher the difficulty the smaller percentage chance you gain each time so the longer the operation takes and the more resources you burn maintaining it. As for what the operations are, gather information increases your intel and max intel level for a short while, letting you know more info about the empire and their power in relation to you. Spark diplomatic instant attempts to manufacture an event which will reduce the empire's relations with other empires or diplomatic weight, prepare sleeper cells increases your skill during operations and prevents infiltration from decaying for a short period of time. Acquire asset grants you a random asset to be used on operations. This is normally a spy from the target empire that will give you very specific buffs for very specific operations. Extort favors allows you to gain favors for use in diplomacy. Smear campaign reduces the target's opinion with a random empire or damages the cohesion of any federation they're a part of. Steel technology grants you 30% progress in a random tech they've researched but you have not. If they have not completed anything you haven't, you'll instead gain a thousand research in every category. Sabotage Starbase destroys a module or building in a target starbase. And lastly, armed privateers spawns a hostile pirate fleet army in one of the Empire systems, and the size of this is based on the target's total fleet power. Basically, espionage allows you to do a little bit of behind the scenes sneaky trolling, it puts empires at a disadvantage without being as obvious as wars. Be warned that events can crop up during espionage, which can expose you and harm your relations with the target as well as others, so conduct operations at your own risk. The final diplomatic mechanic to know about is the galactic community. Once any empire has communications with at least 70% of other empires in game, you'll have the option to join a forming galactic community or opt out. If you join, you'll get to propose and vote on all kinds of resolutions which will affect every single empire in the community. These resolutions are for all kinds of things like the rules of war, approach to space fauna and galactic commerce. Normally they're all a trade-off, both in one playstyle whilst nerfing another, so make sure you're voting smart to keep yourself as powerful as possible without accidentally collapsing another aspect of your empire. To propose a resolution, you select one of the topics and an option, click it and confirm. You'll be able to see the predicted support of each resolution and not only will this dictate the chances of success, each round of voting will be on the resolutions with the most support, so if support is low, it may never make it to the voting stage at all. You can propose an emergency vote while the Senate is in recess every 20 years to rush a resolution to the top, just make sure you need it to make the most of the cooldown. Voting takes place on the Senate floor and each empire's voting power is decided by their diplomatic weight and can be increased by assigning envoys to the galactic community. Once the time is up, whichever side has the most support will decide if the resolution passes or not. That is really all there is to it. There are specific event-based resolutions like defending against the crisis, but these are rare and follow more or less the same structure, but now a little bit more drama and story. All that's left to do now is to decide which empires you don't like and get to warring. It is almost inevitable that at some point in every game, you'll be involved in a war one way or another. Whether you're looking to conquer the galaxy or simply defend your borders, you'll need to know the rules of war and how to most effectively come out on top. No matter how a war starts, both sides must pick a war goal as we mentioned in the diplomacy section. Most of the time this is to conquer claims, but there are all kinds of options for ideology, subjugation and humiliation. For most of these outside of claims, you need to have a casus belli, which is just a fancy Latin phrase which means reason for war. These can be acquired through all kinds of actions like rivalries, power discrepancies and certain civics, so be sure to check which you have on an empire before committing to a war. Now, no matter which war goal each side ends up selecting, the actual gameplay is the same with the only change being what happens if you convince the other side to surrender. If your goal is to vassalize them, their surrender will make them your vassal. If it was to conquer claims, then you gain control of these selected systems. But before you can do that, you first need to convince the other empires to surrender, and that is where war exhaustion comes in. Wars can end in one of two ways. One side totally conquers the other or maxes out their war exhaustion. This is basically the empire's will to continue the war, and the higher it gets, the more likely they'll be to surrender and take a much less favorable peace deal. You can increase their war exhaustion by pretty much everything involved in wars, so taking out their fleets, space stations and planets. It also passively builds up over time, so even if not much fighting is happening for either side, it cannot go on forever. Space combat is as easy as sending your fleet into their territory to attack star bases and fleets. 
Keep an eye on fleet power of both enemy fleets and more developed space stations to make sure your own fleet will be able to win, as the last thing you want is sending your own fleet to the slaughter if you can avoid it. Planets are a little bit more complicated. You can attack them with fleets to bomb them from orbit, but this has a number of downsides. You need a specific policy to accept a planet's surrender from bombardment, otherwise you'll reduce them to a crater, which can lose you a lot of progress. It also holds your fleet in place for a long time when it could be conquering more territory and taking out other enemy fleets. Yes, they're taking no damage and can reinforce, so it's good for a quick break, but outside of that, I can't recommend it. Instead, you'll want to use armies. These can either be created on individual planets using the armies tab, or by selecting the army builder tab on a space station in the same sector as some planets. This second option will automatically distribute the recruitment between planets in the sector and cause the army to rally at the location, meaning you don't need to manually merge everything together. Once you have an army, you'll need to get to an enemy planet, and it's a good idea to ensure the route is clear of enemies, as they cannot survive even the mildest of space combat. It's good practice to put armies on the evasive fleet stands, so they'll run the first sign of danger to keep themselves alive. Once they're there, right-click a planet and select Land Armies. The army should disappear, and clicking on the armies tab of the target planet should show you how the invasion is going, with army strength on either side, and almost all of the time, the side with the most strength will win. As you progress through the game, you'll unlock different options to take into your armies, and looking at them in the recruit menu of a planet will give you some info about how they'll perform. It's a lot of numbers, but it's damage to HP and morale, HP and morale of the units, and collateral damage, aka the rate at which devastation is created when in combat. Devastation is basically how damaged the planet becomes whilst combat is taking place. The higher it is, the less productive the planet will be in basically every function, pops will start to die and buildings will be destroyed. Once fighting stops, devastation slowly goes away, but just be mindful of how destroyed invaded planets are becoming, especially if you're looking to take them for yourself, as they could end up being more work than they're worth for a little while. If you win the combat, whatever's left of your army will leave the planet again, and depending on your war type, you'll take some form of control over the planet. Honestly, planets can slow your war right down, so I find it's best to just race through enemy territory with fleets taking all their starbase and destroying fleets, and then bringing ground armies to take over any planets left behind. And that's honestly all there is to war. Now, obviously, you have to use a bit of strategy to attack using the right routes, maximize your territory gain, and get the best pathing possible to benefit yourself and outwit opponents. You need to make sure you're well defended with star bases, like I mentioned earlier, but also fortress worlds with some landed armies to keep them safe. Likewise, if enemies have a stronghold and a choke point, you can capture it, then use the position to your advantage to cut them off from their own empires and defend the only way through with your fleet as well as any captured stations. After a short while, any stations you beat in combat will come back online and be under your control, meaning sometimes your brand new territory will defend itself for you. Just take a look at the loadout of any captures to make sure they're working the best for you. The entire goal of Wars in Stellaris isn't necessarily to just take as much opponent territory as possible, but also to keep yourself safe. So even if you win the war, you're not in a worse state than when you started. If you find yourself at 100% exhaustion, you'll be forced to accept a status quo peace agreement after 24 months, which basically means all territory currently occupied by both sides will be maintained and the war will cease. Once peace is agreed, a new war cannot begin between the two empires for 10 years, so make sure that you're prepared for that time to run out, should things heat up again. But outside of wars, how do you actually go about winning the game, since it needs to end at some point, right? When you start your game, you will have set an end date for it, and this is when whichever empire has the highest score will automatically win, and we went over the score in the UI section way back towards the start of this behemoth video. So whichever empire is at the top will win at the end of the time limit, but this is all assuming that you can survive whatever endgame crisis you end up with. When you started your game, you'll also have set a year for the endgame to start, as well as selected a crisis. Once you reach the endgame year, your crisis will spawn and present a galactic threat, which will require a lot of planning, skill and resources to survive, let alone beat. There are currently three in-game and each will challenge you with extreme military power basically out of nowhere. Each of the options comes with their own special brand of agony, but the running theme is make sure you're scaling your military both offensive and defensive into the late game no matter what you're building. You can turn off crises if you want a game just between normal empires, just drag their strength to zero. But if you get into the late game and look for a challenge, be careful what you wish for, because they'll come a knock in pretty damn hard. So if you do survive the crisis, your other options are top score or eliminate all other empires, which to be honest, also just means you have the top score by default. And that is just about everything I can think of for how to play Stellaris. If I somehow missed anything in this Goliath of a video, then ask it down in the comment section down below and I'll do my best to help you out. Like, subscribe, and if you want more Stellaris content, then check out this video here, ranking every single piece of DLC in a tier list.